Well, here we are, the debate so many of you have been waiting for. In one corner, we have our hero, a Christian former atheist, David Wood, a.k.a. The Dizzle, defender of the downtrodden, friend of the fatherless, enemy of oppressors. And in the other corner, we have our villain, an atheist, former Muslim, Ridvan Idemir, a.k.a. The Apostate Prophet, soon to be known as The Apostate from Atheism, and perhaps the next Nabil. I'd like to thank AP for agreeing to unite our platforms as we explore the connection between God and morality. But I should point out here at the beginning, the two great blunders AP has already made, one very common blunder and one very uncommon blunder. The common blunder can be seen around the world. It's a form of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. As millions of Muslims are abandoning Islam, many of them end up abandoning far more than Islam. Instead of simply rejecting Muhammad as a prophet and the Quran as the word of Allah, they decide to reject religion in general, the existence of God, and anything associated with a supernatural realm. The problem here, apart from being overly hasty and wrong, is that some beliefs that ex-Muslims want to keep actually depend on things that they're throwing out. Much of this debate will focus on one particular example. So, that's the common blunder. The uncommon blunder is that AP has entered into a structured, careful, in-depth debate stretched out over several weeks. As a rule, if you want to go on thinking that our beliefs about morality can be rationally justified without God, you have to keep your thinking pretty superficial. You have to rely on rhetorical tricks and misrepresentations of your opponent's positions. You don't want to take the time to ponder the issues rigorously and meticulously. It seems, then, that AP's atheism was doomed to destruction the moment we agreed on a format. But don't take my word for this. Let's start the debate and see what happens. When we talk about morality, we're talking about things like moral obligation. Human beings have moral obligations to do certain things and not to do other things. Moral value, some things are intrinsically good. Moral responsibility, certain actions make us worthy of praise or blame. Moral improvement, people become better or worse, and so on. Here in my opening statement, I'm going to focus on moral obligation. Many of AP's criticisms of Muhammad have to do with Muhammad violating basic moral obligations and commanding or allowing his followers to violate basic moral obligations. But what are we doing when we say that someone who lived 14 centuries ago in a completely different part of the world should have followed certain moral rules that we somehow have access to? What sense does it make to impose moral obligations across space and time? It seems that moral obligations have some peculiar features. Let's consider four of these peculiar features. First, moral obligations are most naturally expressed and understood as authoritative commands. They're imperatives. Do this, don't do that. This raises an obvious question. Who's issuing these commands? The answer to that question is extremely important because if the commands don't come from someone or something with the proper authority over us, we have no obligation to obey them. Second, moral obligations are objective, meaning that we can be right or wrong about them. If an old man thinks that it's perfectly acceptable to have sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl, the fact that he thinks it's perfectly acceptable doesn't make it perfectly acceptable. He's simply wrong. The wrongness of the act is a moral fact, and as the saying goes, facts don't care about our feelings. Now, how can there be facts about morality that are independent of what we think or believe? Moral obligations aren't the sort of things we find out there in the world. We don't find them with a microscope or a telescope. They're in our minds, and yet somehow independent of our minds. So what's the basis of their objectivity and independence? Third, moral obligations are overriding, meaning that they trump other kinds of obligations. If the government makes a law ordering you to hand over Jews or Muslims so that they can be sent to concentration camps, your moral obligation not to treat your fellow human beings that way overrides your legal obligation to aid in their abuse or extermination. We have all sorts of obligations in our lives. Why would one particular kind of obligation, moral obligation, override all others. Fourth, moral obligations are universal, 
we apply them to everyone with a properly functioning mind. Commands like don't torture old ladies for fun apply to all sane human beings. If we hear that someone has been torturing old ladies for fun, we would condemn his behavior regardless of where he comes from, which religion he follows, or what his political views happen to be. Why are we convinced that the commands in our heads are somehow commands to all human beings? So, moral obligations have some interesting features, and a good theory of morality should clarify and explain why moral obligations have these interesting features. The problem for our atheist friends is that atheistic theories of morality don't clarify and explain why moral obligations have these features. Instead, atheistic theories of morality undermine our moral obligations and suggest that we're delusional about our moral obligations. That's why some of you atheists, as I was drawing attention to some very basic features of moral obligations, were thinking to yourselves, no, moral obligations aren't objective. No, they're not universal. Your metaphysics has mutilated your concept of moral obligation until someone does something to you, in which case you'll suddenly snap back to believing in objective, overriding, universal moral obligations. Fortunately, theistic theories of morality don't suggest that we're delusional about our moral obligations. Take what's called divine command theory. Divine command theory claims that our moral obligations are commands of God. Now, atheists tend to misunderstand this theory in two ways. One, they think that divine command theorists are asserting that you can only know what your moral obligations are if God gives you some special revelation like the Bible or the Quran. I've heard Muslim apologists make claims along these lines. It seems to be fairly common in Islam to think that apart from God telling you something through some special revelation, you just don't know what to do. But outside of Islam, I've never heard a divine command theorist say that we can only know what our moral obligations are through something like the Bible or the Quran. There can be specific commands given in scripture, but as far as general moral obligations are concerned, all rational human beings have some kind of access to them. Divine command theory is a philosophical claim about what moral obligations really are, what their nature is, what their status is, not about how we become aware of them. As far as how we become aware of our moral obligations, God can communicate through special revelations such as the books of the Bible, but this wouldn't be the only way that we learn about our moral obligations. God creates us with a capacity for understanding moral truths, just as he creates us with a capacity for understanding mathematical and logical truths. God can communicate his commands through the human conscience. The Bible talks about Gentiles who haven't received any special revelation obeying God's commands by nature because God's commands have been written on their hearts. The main way we learn about our moral obligations is by being taught. Think about a parallel with something like mathematics. People had to figure out mathematical truths down through history. But once they figured out mathematical truths, these mathematical truths were then passed down through teaching, education. Your parents taught you numbers and basic operations. You learned more difficult concepts in school. Likewise, your parents taught you basic moral obligations. You learned more from society and so on. So we arrive at our knowledge of moral obligations through a combination of factors. We have a capacity for learning moral truths. Most human beings have a conscience. Other people teach us our moral obligations and we read about them in scripture. The other common atheist misunderstanding here is thinking that divine command theorists are asserting that you can only be moral if you believe in God. Here again, that's not what divine command theory claims. Think about mathematics again. Here's a question. What is a number? You might think that it's just a concept in your head, but numbers seem to have some sort of reality apart from our use of them. The laws of nature have numerical constants in them. Numbers are everywhere in nature, whether we're aware of them or not. So what are they? Suppose, hypothetically, just as an illustration, that the true reality of numbers, their ultimate reality, is that they are eternal ideas in the mind of God. I'm not claiming that. Again, this is just to illustrate. Suppose that numbers are eternal ideas in the mind of God. We could call this divine number theory. 
When God creates the universe, he uses numbers, which is why numbers are everywhere. And God creates us in his image with a capacity for doing mathematics, which allows us to use mathematics and to discover the numbers in nature. Notice, if divine number theory were true, you could still use numbers, you could still do math, you could still uncover the laws of nature, even if you didn't know that numbers are actually eternal ideas in the mind of God. You could still do math even if you didn't believe in God, because you've been created with the ability to do math regardless of what you believe about God. Similarly, if divine command theory is correct, your moral obligations are, ultimately, commands of God. But you become aware of those obligations in a variety of ways, so you can honor your moral obligations even if you have absolutely no clue what their ultimate nature is, and even if you don't believe that they come from God. Now, if we can honor our moral obligations without knowing where they come from, why do we need something like divine command theory? Well, we seem to understand that it's important to know where our moral obligations come from. There's a reason there are so many theories of morality being discussed at the scholarly level and at the popular level. We want a theory that explains and justifies our beliefs about right and wrong. Divine command theory accomplishes this task quite well. Consider the four features of moral obligations we discussed earlier. Moral obligations are most naturally expressed and understood as authoritative commands. Do this, don't do that. Why are they most naturally expressed and understood as authoritative commands? Because they're authoritative commands. They're commands from God. Moral obligations are objective, meaning that we can be right or wrong about them. How can they be objective? Because God has issued certain commands. If you think you have a moral obligation and it actually comes from God, then you're right about your moral obligation. If you think you have a moral obligation and it doesn't actually come from God, you're wrong about your moral obligation. This is why we can look at people who have significantly different moral views and conclude that someone is wrong here. There are people who are very bad at math. There are people who are very bad at logic. And there are people who are very bad at morality. Moral obligations are overriding, meaning that they trump other kinds of obligations. Why are moral obligations overriding? Because a command from God, your creator and sustainer, takes precedence over other kinds of commands, such as commands from your government. Moral obligations are universal. We apply them to everyone with a properly functioning mind. Why are moral obligations universal? Because we're all created in the image of God, and our Creator has given all of us commands. So, divine command theory accounts for the main features of moral obligations quite easily. What about atheistic moral theories? Again, moral obligations are most naturally expressed and understood as authoritative commands. But where do these authoritative commands come from if they don't come from God? There aren't a lot of options for atheists. You could be hardwired to act in certain ways, in which case your DNA is somehow issuing commands, but it's difficult to see how a mindless molecule could be a proper authority on issues of morality. You could simply decide for yourself what your moral obligations are, in which case you'd be issuing commands for yourself, but if you're the one imposing moral obligations on yourself, you can obviously release yourself from those moral obligations, so that isn't helpful. Society certainly commands us to behave in certain ways, but something can't be right or wrong simply because society says so, because societies are, very frequently, moral failures. Given atheistic moral theories, what we think of as moral obligations don't seem to come from anything remotely resembling a legitimate moral authority, which suggests that our moral obligations aren't obligations at all. Moral obligations are objective. But how can they be objective if there's no legitimate moral authority behind them? How can it be true that I have an objective moral obligation to do X if what I think of as my moral obligations are just inclinations provided by my DNA or personal choices or the latest views of my ever-changing culture?
moral obligations are overriding. But why would an inclination provided by my DNA or a personal choice or some rule of society trump all of my other obligations? Moral obligations are universal. But if what I think of as my moral obligations come from my DNA or my personal choice or my society, why in the name of common sense would I think that a different person with different DNA in a different society has any of the same moral obligations I have? The peculiar features of moral obligations make no sense in an atheistic world. Instead of explaining why moral obligations are expressed as authoritative commands, why they're objective, why they're overriding, and why they're universal, atheistic theories suggest that our ordinary moral thinking is delusional. AP is welcome to prove me wrong here, but good luck with that. I was plumbing the depths of morality and immorality long before the apostate prophet figured out how to put on his lederhosen in Deutschland. When I say that moral obligations just don't make sense in an atheistic world, this isn't David Wood the Christian insulting an opposing position. It's how I ended up viewing morality when I was an atheist. Let me describe my thinking back then, and AP and the rest of you can tell me where I went wrong. Here was the worldview of David the atheist. We've got this massive universe, and over here, there's this little blob we call the Milky Way. Out on one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way is a ball of hot gas we call the sun. Circling that ball of hot gas is a speck of dust we call Earth. And on the surface of this speck of dust are these little lumps of cells called humans, who are only there because their ancestors managed to pass on genetic material better than other lumps of cells. And these human lumps of cells are now convinced that they have incredible significance and dignity, that what they do really matters, and that their deepest values, so precious to them, are something more than mutant traits that helped their ancestors transmit DNA or the product of cultural indoctrination. They think that they have objective moral obligations, but objective moral obligations make no sense whatsoever in this world. Everything we do is the result of signals and chemical reactions in our brains. But our brains are physical. They're made of particles. And particles are governed by laws of nature, which means that all of our decisions and actions were determined long before we were born. How can we possibly think of ourselves as morally responsible for anything we do? Notice, all I did there was apply the exact same reasoning to morality that I had already applied to religion. Earlier in life, I thought to myself, they tell me to believe in God. Some of them say that they can feel the presence of God. But I see absolutely no evidence for the existence of God, so I'm not going to live my life as if there's a God, no matter how much they don't like my skepticism. Then eventually, I thought to myself, they tell me to believe in their moral values. Some of them say that they feel this or that is right or wrong but I see absolutely no evidence for their moral values. So I'm not going to live my life as if their moral values are valid, no matter how much they don't like my moral skepticism. Some atheists are similarly consistent. They apply the same skepticism to moral claims that they apply to religious claims. You can read some Nietzsche or some J.L. Mackey for examples. Far more atheists, however, are extremely inconsistent here. They apply one level of skepticism to belief in God, and they reject the existence of God. But they don't want to reject belief in objective moral values, so they radically lower their level of skepticism so that they can go on believing in their moral claims. Inconsistency at its finest. God and objective moral obligations stand together or fall together. Nietzsche realized that. He tried to live consistently by rejecting both God and moral obligation. Then he went insane, although syphilis may have had something to do with that. I tried to live consistently by rejecting both God and moral obligation. I also started going insane. But a little before I was carted off to my third mental hospital, I re-examined the evidence, and I chose the other consistent path, God and moral obligation. And the world suddenly made sense. Now, before you atheists misunderstand me here, I'm not saying that you're going to go insane. That's reserved for a particular kind of people with a maniacal obsession for going wherever their positions lead them. 
I'm saying that in order to avoid believing in God and to avoid going insane, you're going to be inconsistent. And inconsistency is not going to win this debate. Prove me wrong, AP, if you're able.